that last time we were proving this theorem that uh, F signature determines uh, whether the ring is strong graph regular or not. So F signature is positive if and only if R is strong graph regular. So last time we showed the direction from positivity to F regularity is easy. By contradiction, if it's not F regular, we easily showed uh, just by taking negative of the definition that F signature is going to be zero. So the more difficult definition is to show positivity starting from strong F regularity. So let's start working on this. And uh, the first thing that I want to say is that we can assume, uh, we may assume that R is a complete domain. So with some work for which we don't have time, you can show that strong F regularity passes to completion. And then we showed yesterday that um, anything strong F regular has to be, well, and local has to be a domain. So this is how we get here. Now, once we know that it's a complete domain, we can use the theorem of Cohen and Gabber. So Cohen and Gabber. So Cohen's theorem tells us that uh, any complete ring uh, containing the field will contain its uh, uh, coefficient field, right? So a field isomorphic to the residue field. So there exists A, which is a power series subring inside R, such that this is a finite extension. And what the addition of Gabber says is that we can choose this A so that this containment is generically separable. Generically separable means that if we pass, if we localize at the fraction field of A, we are going to get here a field, here we are going to get a field, and those fields are separable extension. The consequence of this from separability of fields is that, uh, well, purely inseparable con extension and separable uh, extensions are disjoint. So if we lift it up, we are going to get that there exists a non-zero element C inside A, so that C is going to map the ring of P roots uh, inside the ring generated by P roots of A, right? So this is algebra, right? Subring of this one generated by P roots only in A. And we can also show that this is isomorphic to the tensor product of R and the ring of P roots. So this comes from this generic assumption, right? The same statement holds for the, on the field level, and then we just use infinitely generated, we collect denominators and we get C. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is for all E. Okay, so what can we do with this? So we have a magic uh, constant C, element C inside A, provided by Cohen Gabbers theorem. Now we assume that R is strong graph regular, so let's try to use the definition for this element C. So we will find some integer E0 uh, for which this condition holds. So there is this system map also, there is an integer, there is a map phi inside home such that uh, phi of F well, let, let me write the period. One P E zero is going to be equal to one. And from this data, we will construct splittings to show that the signature is positive, right? So we are going to construct a big, sufficiently big number of uh, free summons so that we will get actual positivity. So our starting point is that a itself is a regular ring, right, power series ring, and we know that then the ring of P roots is going to be free. We know that A1 over PE is free over A, and we ever know what is the basis. So the basis, let's say, BE 
will be consisting of elements lambda and then x1 a over p e, x d a over p e. So this lambda is the basis of the field extension p over k and a i's, so this is a d, this is a one, are just uh, somewhere between zero and p e. So we know an explicit basis, right? And using this explicit basis in A, we will start constructing free summons in R using this formula. So first of all, we can do the tensor product to start getting something free over R, right? We know that by tensoring this, R tensor A1 over P is going to be free over R and the basis is just we get it by tensoring, right, the elements of this basis, right? In particular, here, because this is a basis, we'll have projection maps, right? We have maps, let's call them psi beta, so that if I apply, so beta and b, and let's call it b and b prime, are inside the basis, so if I apply this projection on the basis element B to any other basis element B prime, what am I going to get? I'm going to get either one or zero, one if B is equal to B prime and zero otherwise, right? Because this is a projection map. How do I get three summons? I just project onto basis, right? So I'll get the same maps induced here, right? It is R3 and I can get you explicit presentation as a free model just by tensoring those homomorphisms that they have here, the projection ones. So this was first stage. Now we need to use that our element C is uh, going to be magical. So what are we going to get? We are going to get that if we have multiplication by C, right, on R, so it's not going to go in R one over P, it's going to go there, so R tensor A one over P E, and this is going to be this appropriate number of, I mean, appropriate rank free model, right? So what is, uh, what is left is to twist this map, right? Uh, so what did they say? So what did I say? Ah, I see. What did I say? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what, what do I get here? So I get that this one was R3, right? And I want to multiply R into this. The problem is that I'm not uh, surjective here, right? So this is what I'm doing wrong, right? Okay, so, uh, so what do we do? So we want to combine this with multiplication. So if I make now maps, um, I need the letter pi, pi B, right? Combined with multiplication of C with this, so multiplication of C with this maps one tensor psi B, right? I'm going to get maps so that as I send my basis element pi B applied to B prime, right? Because uh, this element B prime is still element inside, inside uh, it is element inside the P roots of A, but P roots of A contained in R, right? So I still can apply it here, and you see that by this definition, the result of my, uh, I mean, the result is the same as what I get here multiplied by C, right? So this is going to be either C or zero, depending whether B is equal to B prime. So the benefit is now this map is defined on R one over P. Okay, uh, so 
uh, what is left is that I don't like C over here, right? Because this is not going to split, right? This is a map which sends uh, some element inside R1 over PE to R, right? But I want to get a surjective map so that I can split and I get the surjective map using the map phi. So what I can do is that I can take R1 over PE plus E naught, right? And then I will map by what I have here, direct sum of pi B1 over P0. And then I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to apply phi. And the end result is now a surjective map on the appropriate number of, on the free model of appropriate rank. So this last step, applying phi maps this element C, right, C one over P E zero, right, because I took P roots here, right, it will send it to one. So all those maps are surjective and they were disjoint by the construction. So long story short, what did we get? We got that uh, this number of, uh, so F signature of R is going to be greater or equal then the limit as e goes to infinity. And here we get this number of splitting, so number of elements in BE. And this is rank of F lower star E plus E zero over R. And then, well, we know actually that this um, this basis had how many elements? It was a generic rank of uh, F lower star E, right? Of just as uh, the P roots of A1 over PE, so the same as rank of R1 over PE here. All right. So if you do the cancellation, we see that this limit is positive. So it's going to be, well, equals to one over rank of R one over P zero. So this is positive. Does it make sense? All right, so essentially from the cohen gabber theorem, we can very explicitly construct uh, the number of uh, splittings uh, which will give me positive F signature. All right, so now uh, we close this chapter and we start new chapter. So we are going to start actually working to prove this theorem that I promised at the beginning that both F signature and Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity at the value one, they detect, uh, they detect um, whether the ring is regular or singular. As a starting point, I want to prove uh, that they satisfy localization property. So what do I mean by localization property? Is that if I localize, my invariants behave in appropriate way. Because we know that localization of a regular ring is going to be regular. So I, if I uh, if I need to, if I want to get the theorem that shows that my invariant detects singularity, it should behave in the same way, right? So let's start with a finite case. So suppose that uh, R is an finite local domain. Local domain. So then I can show and P is a prime. So what I can show is that F signature localized of the localization is going to be greater or equal than F signature of the original ring and opposite inequality works for Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity. If I localize, it's going to get less or equal. So again, if we claim that this value being one should say if it be a regular, then all other values at the other point should be also one. Okay, so this is a very easy theorem uh, because uh, we have this geometric definitions. 
so what do I have? I know that to compute Hilbert-Kuhn's multiplicity, I will need to look at the minimal number of generators of f lower star e r, right? So this is a sum, uh, sum finitely generated module. And what do I know? If I take minimal generators in r, and I localize at the prime, they still will generate the localization, right? So the minimal number of generators here is going to be greater or equal than the minimal number generators of localization. Just because the original generators still work, but then I look at the number of minimal number of generators, so it may decrease. And the opposite inequality works for the splitting number. If so what is the splitting number? I write f lower star e r is equal to some free summand, right, plus some module m. What happens if I localize? It may happen that localization of m is going to get another splitting, right? So mp may split and I will increase, or it may not split, and then uh, the number of free summands is going to stay the same. So it's easy just from the geometric definition. The only downside is that uh, while this level of generality, a finite local domain, uh, works perfectly for a signature, if I know that the signature is equal to one, it's going to be positive, and in particular, R is going to be a domain. This level of generality, on the other hand, is not very satisfactory if you want, uh, if you want to prove a statement about Hilbert-Kuhn's multiplicity, because we don't need to be a finite, we, need to, uh, we don't need to be a local domain to talk about a signature, uh, to talk about Hilbert-Kuhn's multiplicity. So what I want to do now is to remove these assumptions for Hilbert-Kuhn's multiplicity, and I want to also do it in a way so that I can um, showcase this uniform convergence method that I was um, selling to you the other day. So what we are going to do is to prove theorem two. So I take local ring. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a finite. It doesn't need to be a domain. And I'm going to take a prime ideal such that um, a dimension of the localization plus dimension of quotient are going to add up to the dimension of R. So I claim that the same inequality holds. To prove this theorem, I will need to provide you a lemma that will uh, allow me to go from R to R localized at P. So first, uh, yeah, so how to word it? So actually maybe let's state it as a theorem. So let me, under the same assumptions, so same assumptions, I want to prove to you that if I take Hilbert-Kuhn's multiplicity, so let me, no, let me say that not the same assumptions, let me take prime P, let me take co-dimension, so let me start the proof. So let me, I can prove this statement by induction on the co-dimension, right? So I can do it by further localization. So by localizing further, I can take P, and some prime Q containing M, right? And I can localize, if I know that the inequality works for M and Q, I can localize that Q and prove the inequality for P and Q. So by induction, I can assume that dimension of R mod P is going to be equal to one. I just take maximal chain from P to M and I do it once at a time using localization. So now, 
in this situation, so dimension of R mod P is equal to one, I want to prove to you that the limit as n approaches infinity of Hilbert-Kunz multiplicities of P plus Xn, where in this condition I take X such that X plus P is P prime, is M primary, so I take a parameter modulo P, I lift it to R, so now I get a element X such as the ideal that generate together with P is going to be M primary. So in particular, the Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of ideal P plus Xn is defined. I can compute it, and then if I divide by N, I can compute the limit of this Hilbert-Kunz multiplicities as a, well, in this case, it's just going to be equal to the Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of X R mod P times Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of R P. So let's try to prove this theorem two and then see how it applies to theorem one. So uh, how I want to prove uh, theorem two? I want to, so this is proof of theorem two. I want to consider the sequence, uh, let's call it A, yeah, let's call it A and E, which is given as the length of uh, R modulo P bracket PE plus X and P E R, right? And P E. So this is a bisequence dependent on two parameters, parameter N and parameter E. I know that the limit that I wrote over there is a double limit as I first take limit of E and I take limit of N, right? So if I compute limit as E approaches infinity of A and E, I'm going to get Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of P plus X and R divided by N, right? I also know that if I take limit as N approaches infinity of the sequence, then what I'm going to get? I'm going to get here nothing else as uh, Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. So it's a limit as, uh, so I get multiplicity of, um, uh, so X P E on the ring R mod P P. By properties of Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, I can actually erase this P E I mean, it just goes outside, right? It's P times multiplicity of element X. So I cancel one copy on the numerator and one copy in denominator. So I will get this, right? And then I have associativity formula. And I get that this limit is equal also to what? To the sum as P uh, minimal primes of maximal dimension of R mod I because, uh, not I, P. And here I will get multiplicity of X R mod P. And here I'm going to get um, a length of R localized at P modulo Frobenius bracket power. dimension of R minus one. 
Does it make sense? So the usual associativity formula tells me that the multiplicity of a module is going to be the sum over minimal primes of R mod P, and here is this colent of a module, right? So this is a colent of localization of this ring at the prime P, right? The only minimal prime. So if you take the limit of this as E approaches infinity, Look, the denominator is appropriate dimension for R localized at P, right? So the limit of this as P goes to, as E goes to infinity is going to be exactly what I told you over there. Multiplicity of E X R mod P, Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of R P, right? So you see that the theorem two is equivalent to the statement that two different iterated limits are equal, that I can interchange the order of limits, right? Because C over here, what did I do? I computed the limit as n approaches infinity, then I can compute the limit as E approaches infinity, and I found that this limit is exactly what I claimed, right? E x R mod P, Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of R localized at P, right? And the statement, uh, sorry, ah, no, other way around. This is this limit. So this is the one that we have there, the limit of Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicities, and there this, this is the limit that I claim it's equal to. So what do we have? We reduce the statement to proving that we can exchange the order of two limits. When can we exchange the order of two limits? When the convergence is uniform. This is the standard theorem of calculus is that we can change the order of two limits if single limits exist and converges at one of them is uniform. So it remains to me to show that the convergence, that we indeed have uniform convergence and I will want to get it from there, right? So remains to prove that we have uniform convergence. But I told you where the convergence estimates come from. They just come from a lemma that bounds lengths. So I want to prove that if I take a model and this such type of prime, and I take bracket powers here, and I add x and p e m, then this is less than some constant c and p e d. Uh, yeah, dimension of m. So if I have such convergence estimate which refines the original bound, right, on the, con on the estimate, if I, didn't uh, if I didn't specialize this parameter n, then you can go through the convergence machinery through the proof of existence of Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity, and this lemma will then imply that I will get uniform convergence. I'll get that P plus X minus this length, right, Xn, are going to be bounded uniformly by C and P E D minus one. Because the constant, I told you that this constant of convergence over there is just a multiple of a constant of that we get over there for torsion models, right? So I will get this dependence on parameter n here, but if I divide both sides by n, now I get uniform convergence, which does not depend on n. So it all comes from this lemma. If I have this lemma, then just the convergence estimates that we set up when we showed existence of Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity will show me 
uniform convergence, that convergence of this limit as E approaches infinity does not depend on N. But this lemma is very easy to show because we have uh, just an exact sequence which allows me to prove such a statement by induction. I can have, uh, so what do I have? I have M, so let's not call it M, let's call it, let me just say that, say N is this quotient model, M modulo PE, P to the power P M. So I have exact sequence, N modulo XN plus one M to N modulo xn n. The usual filtration exact sequence, I have this map just because this is a smaller ideal. And what do I have in the kernel? You can show that in the kernel I will have n and here xn plus annihilator of xn inside m, right? But this is a homomorphic image of n mod xn, right? So from this exact sequence, if you compute the length, you can show by induction, right, that the length of n modulo xn n is going to be less or equal than n times length of the original quotient by x. Right. So just induction here. If I know the statement for n, I'll get the statement for n plus one because here I add one copy, right? Okay. So this finishes the proof of theorem two. We start with this lemma. From this lemma, we feed the output of this lemma into the convergence estimates we did before. We get from here uniform convergence as E approaches infinity, independent on N, and then the th as a general calculus fact allows us to exchange the order of limits. And from here, we get that uh, we compute double limit one way, we compute double limit the other way, and this is exactly the statement of theorem two. And that was theorem. Okay, any questions? So overall, this is the strength of uh, this uniform convergence approach, right? That we need to do very little to get various uniform convergence estimates like the ones that we did here. All right. So let me raise this. And now we can actually deduce theorem one from theorem two. So I will need one more little ingredient. So I need to prove a lemma. So if you take a local ring and I take I M primary, uh, then I can show that Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of I is going to be less or equal than Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of R times length of the quotient of R mod I. So this is often called filtration bound, right? So how is this proved? So I look at um, what is the, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to take a filtration giving me the length of R mod I. So it's I modulo I1 and so on. Uh, sorry, this is a strict inequality. And then I'll get I L and this is equal to R, right? Because what is the colon? What is the length of the quotient? I can think about as the length of the largest saturated chain of ideals, right? So L is the length of R mod I. Because this is a saturated chain, what I can tell about the quotient of I, let's say, K plus one modulo I K. Well, 
it needs to be isomorphic to R mod M, right? Otherwise, I could have saturated it more. And then what I can do is that I can just put bracket powers to this chain. So bracket power Q, bracket power Q, and so on, bracket power Q. And, well, I could write IK plus one because this is isomorphic to IK uh, R mod M. There is only one generator of IK plus one modulo IK, so I can write it like this. So then what happens if I take bracket powers? I get that here bracket Q, here U to the power Q modulo IKQ. I cannot say that the annihilator of UQ is equal to M bracket Q, but I can say that it contains, right? So I will get, you can easily see that M to the bracket power Q still annihilates U to the power Q, so I'll get a surjection onto this from R modulo M bracket Q, right? just by sending one to the element UQ, and if you just take Q powers of the equation like this, right, you are going to get this surjection array, just because the annihilator, it may be bigger, we don't know it, but I just need an inequality. So, so from this, we will get that uh, the length of R mod I bracket Q is going to be less or equal than L, right, times a length of R modulo M bracket Q, and then we take, we divide everything by Q to the power D, we take the limit, and that's precisely the assertion that I have here. So we just apply Frobenius to the filtration, realizing the coland of I. Okay, very good. So now I can finish theorem one. So I reduce the statement to the case where dimension of R mod P is equal to one, and I still need to show this inequality. So what do I know? I know that the, by theorem one, limit as n approaches infinity of Hilbert-Kunz multiplicities of P plus xn R over n is going to be equal to Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of EXRP times Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of actual R localized at P. So this is theorem one, the theorem two. On the other hand, I also have the lemma which allows me to, um, we have the lemma which allows me to estimate this Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity. So by the lemma, Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of P plus Xn is going to be less or equal than as a length of R mod P plus Xn times Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of R, right? And then I remember that I had the limit. So I had the limit as N approaches infinity divided by N. What do I see here? I have a length of some ring quotient out by Xn divided by N this is a definition of Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. So this is equal to multiplicity of R mod P, Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of R. I look here, I look there, and what do I see? I see the inequality of multiplicity times Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of R and multiplicity times Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of R localized at P. So it follows that if I cancel those two multiplicities, it follows that I get the inequality between localization and the original ring that I wanted. Okay, are there any questions? So we use the uniform convergence machinery to get this formula, right? This is the key part of my proof because this formula allows me to get from M primary ideals to something in the localization, right? So this is a power of uh, theorem two. 
Okay, good. So now I know this localization properties. I know that Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity, if a localize gives the right inequality, and I know that a signature, if a localize gives the right inequality. From this, I will start uh, building uh, the theorems that I want to show. I will start building that uh, those in, I, I will start proving that uh, my invariance detects singularity by essentially using inductive approach. So the general scheme is as follows. So if I assume that Hilbert, well, if my, let's call it invariant F, right, F of R is equal to one, right, then by the localization, it follows that F at any point other prime ideal is also equal to one, right? because the values one are extremal values, both for Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity and for a signature, and the inequality is going the right way. And then I use induction over here on dimension to say that R localized at P is regular. And from here, I want to deduce that R is regular. How can I do this? Well, I will do this by understanding the equimultiplicity condition. So deduce that R is regular from two statements, that RP is regular and that my invariant doesn't change. So this is equimultiplicity. So this is the general scheme of the two proofs that I'm going to give to you. So we will start with doing this proof for a signature and then we will do it for Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity. But the overall scheme is going to be absolutely the same. It's just this equimultiplicity condition, right, is different depending on what invariant you take. But this first part is absolutely the same. All right. So I'll start with the signature and I will start by uh, proving a lemma about splitting. So suppose that a signature of R is going to be greater than zero and suppose then I can split, uh, let's say, uh, E plus M plus whatever it is, uh, let's say N zero. So let me fix just one of the possible direct sum decompositions with some model M that I'm interested in and some model N which I'm not interested in. And then I claim that there exist decompositions of F E for all E. So here is there exist. So for some E naught and the statement that I can get a decomposition for all E so that I actually split a number of copies of M which is going to grow very fast as E approaches infinity such that the limit as E approaches infinity of maybe E over the rank is going to be positive. Good. 
So let me denote AE to be this maximum of, well, the maximal rank, right? Maximal uh, rank of a free summand. Then I can decompose f lower star e plus e naught by uh, taking this decomposition and applying f lower star e naught to it. So it's going to be direct sum, right, of uh, a e copies of f lower star e naught r plus, well, let's call it m e. So plus f lower star e not m e. Right. Just because I take this decomposition and apply Frobenius push forward to it, and I get precisely what I have here, right? And then I can decompose it further, given what was my assumption. So I can say that this is direct sum of a e copies of m, and then I have some other stuff, whatever it is, right? And then I claim that the assumption, uh, the assertion holds because the limit as E approaches infinity of AE over the rank of F lower star E plus E naught of R is going to be, well, is going to be equal to F signature over the rank of the original F lower star E naught R, so it's positive. Does it make sense? So we just iterate thing, right? If I can uh, split a copy of M from, uh, from R, right, F lower star E not R, and I get a lot of copies of R, then I just use these copies to split more and more. So it's a very easy lamp. But from this very easy lemma, I can actually get the equal multiplicity statement that I want. So the theorem that I like to call rigidity theorem tells me that uh, under my assumption, so Rm local F signature is positive, so strongly F regular domain. to have equimultiplicity condition for F signature is equivalent for the entire sequences to be constant. So AE is this, right? The maximal number of direct summons that you can get. So if signature is a limit of the sequence, right? But what I claim is that it's only possible for the limits to be equal if and only if the entire sequences are constant. So this is why I call it rigidity. There cannot be any variation initially, right? It is very, very strong property, right? Something very not intuitive, right? So recall that the signature of R is going to be AER, so limit AER over the rank of F lower star ER, but F signature of R localized at P is going to be, again, limit as E localized at of RP, but the rank is the same, right? Because what is the rank? It's just uh, the rank at the, is a, this is the dimension of the vector space, right, at the generic point. But localization, I mean, R is a domain, the generic point is the same. So these two sequences only limit, only differ in the numerator, right? So this statement exactly tells me that the limits are equal if and only if the entire sequences are constant. And the proof is two lines. So what does it mean that, so one direction is clear, right? If my sequences are constant, well, do not differ, then the limits are going to be equal. So this is trivial. The other direction by contradiction. So I can write, 
So suppose that AER is going to be strictly less than AE of RP, right? Because this is the only way that can happen, right? I know that the number of free summons can only increase. So what does it mean that it increases? I can write F lower star E R to be, um, well, let's write it R A E plus the leftover P. So what does it mean that the number of free summons increases? It means that if I localize M E at P, it's going to give me one more splitting, right? So M E localized at P has a free summon. So these two guys, I mean, all those guys I localize, they're free, right? And how do I get that the number of free summons increases? It should happen from the localizing of ME, right? But then I can just use the lemma. So let me say that this is E0, so that I'm in the assumptions of the lemma, right? At some E0, I get a strict inequality, and then the lemma tells me that I can build further direct sum decomposition, right, of F lower star E R into something which uh, with M, so, mm, so M E zero, so let's say, right, and here we'll get B E, right, and here we are going to get some number of free summons and so on, right? So I get this di direct sum decomposition, which is given by the lemma. I know that if I increase E, I can split more and more copies of this original model M E zero, right? This is what my lemma tells me. And from this, it follows that uh, A E of R localized at P is going to be what? Is going to be greater or equal than this BE copies of M because uh, they're going to give me, uh, each, each will be going to give me at least one free summand plus the original AE of R, right? So this free summand that I had over here, they're not going to disappear anywhere, right? I just get extra ones from getting copies of this model. And what do I know from the assertion that the limit of this guy is not going to be zero, so I must have strict inequality between F signatures too. So this is very, very easy just coming from the lemma. Good? All right, so one second to finish the statement about F signature. If S of R is equal to one, then R is regular. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, if R is regular, then of course the signature is equal to one. We did it, it's uh, just going to be a free model, right? So the, the sequence is constant one. But on the other hand, to prove the interesting direction, if F signature of R is equal to one, then I note that F signature at the generic point is also equal to one, right? Because I know that if F signature is equal to one, then R is strong reflagral, so it's a domain, so there is generic point, and F signature is a generic point, well, since it's a domain, it's going to be also equal to one. And then I use my theorem to deduce from here that AE of R is just equal to the rank at the generic point, right? But this is a generic rank, so I get the entire sequence is equal to one, and therefore I can use the Kuhn's theorem that tells me that regularity is detected by a single AE, right? It tells me that my model has to be free already, right? Okay, thank you, I think I should stop.